Hi, and welcome to the Tomato Timer, a podcast about learning to learn. I'm Z from Xenos, and I'm tuning in live with experts around the world asking your questions and hearing their stories, all before the timer goes off. 24 minutes and 39 seconds to go. Welcome to episode 10 of the Tomato Timer. This is actually a launch of a kind of a series of episodes um, which are going to be doubling up as well, so we're going to have many more. It's a collaboration with STEM Learning UK, one of the biggest kind of educational and training providers here in the UK. And we are going to be bringing on STEM ambassadors, people who are either have studied in these STEM subjects or are in careers and research. And we will be bringing them on and gaining their insights and experience and hopefully kind of exciting you guys, especially at a time when we have a lot more of it um, sitting at home, etc. So today, to start off the episode, we have Tom Knight with us, and he is a chemist at the University of Cardiff who's um, currently doing some experience at Pfizer. So I am really excited to have him. Great to have you, Tom. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm really excited. So just give us a quick intro about what you're doing and where you are right now. Okay, so I've done three years at university now. I'm in the final year of my master's degree in chemistry, and I'm working um, at Pfizer, like you said. Mm-hmm. as a synthetic chemist so i'm working in the labs yeah coming up with um new synthetic routes towards new drug molecules interesting and uh, so which university are you at right now so i'm at cardiff cardiff university in wales okay cool yeah in the wales uh so for the people who don't really know exactly where where in the world um the uk is made up of scotland england wales so and ireland of course um so i wanted to start off with kind of your educational background and we had a lot of questions regarding this because for many of us, natural sciences isn't, isn't a very natural choice in, in university uh, to go off and study. So how did that come about? How did you decide to, to pursue it? Uh, um, so, so it's funny you should say because really, uh, I suppose for, for a lot of my time at school, I wasn't super academic. I was kind of like average, right? So um, I was in like the lower maths set and, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't in the top science class or anything like that. So it seemed pretty far-fetched for me to even mm-hmm. be studying science at university myself. I um, I was always interested in science, but I suppose I kind of, uh, as most teenagers do, I lacked the kind of self-discipline to sit down for hours and study. And uh-huh. so I always thought I was going to go into, say, uh, architecture or design or that sort of thing. So I was quite creative, I like drawing. Ooh. And then I got to sixth form and I started doing my A-levels and I picked chemistry just because I was interested in science and I, I sat my AS uh, mock exam and I came out with an E. Oh gosh. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so I got strongly advised to, to not pick chemistry for my, for, as one of my A-level choices because for those who don't know, you do four subjects and generally you drop one of those so you end up taking three and those are the three that kind of take you to, to university. And um, so I got advised to, to to drop my chemistry A level. Yeah. And um, about halfway halfway through that year, we had a we had a speaker come into school, mm. and um, it was it was one of the parents from the school. He was a, a lecturer in chemi- uh, chemistry at um, university in London, uh, UCL. Okay, cool. <laughs> my university. And he, oh, really? Oh, okay, yeah. right. You probably know him then. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, he came in to give this talk on on what he was kind of doing, as I suppose probably as part of STEM. And um, he was doing a lot of cool research into new methods for delivering drugs. So he was doing work on um, nano cages for delivering drugs to specific sites in the body and using um, UV light to activate those kind of molecular cages to open and release the drugs into the body. And I thought, oh, wow, this is really cool. Um, so, so at, at the time I, I wanted to study pharmacy because I, I kind of wanted to, you know, help people with diseases and treat drugs and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and I thought it's probably a good idea that I actually do some work experience in a pharmacy to figure out if yeah. it's what I want to do for the next kind of 40, 50 years of my life. And, um, I'm so glad I did that because those two weeks were probably the most boring, <laughs> <laughs> um, un- unenjoyable weeks of work that i've ever done in my life i really didn't enjoy it yeah because it, it was something i was quite set on um by the time i was halfway through my levels and then i was a bit kind of you know thrown up in the air i was like what do i do now because you know this is what i thought i was going to do for the last couple of years and now i realized i don't like it so so i kind of spoke to my parents i tried to get advice from teachers and stuff mm. 
Um, and my dad said to me, well, you found this, this talk really interesting. Why don't you look in studying chemistry at university? And so I, so I did. So I, I, I actually spoke to that lecturer and said, do you mind if I come and, come and visit your lab at, at UCL and see what it is you do kind of day to day, like what your wow, job involves? That's proactive. Um, yeah. I suppose, yeah, I suppose, well, I suppose panicking about what I was going to be doing at university. So, so, um, luckily he said, he said, yeah, sure. Come along. So I went to visit his lab and it was really cool. He had all these, he had like loads of 3d printers going and printing, you know, like micro reactors and all these UV lamps and chemical fume hoods and, and, you know, I state of the art computers and software. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. This is, this is something I want to do. So, uh, so I picked chemistry. Yeah. Amazing. And, and how's it like treated you, especially, um, if you don't mind, you didn't feel as confident in kind of the A-level content of it, at least. Did, did the, the passion kind of hit you a bit later and, and it pushed you forward? Definitely, definitely. So I'm, this is something I, f- I figured out quite late on in my education. It's I'm the sort of person that struggles to learn something if I can't see an immediate practical application for it. Uh-huh. Um, I, I often struggle to learn kind of concepts for the the sake of learning them and so when i when the speaker came in and told us about chemistry research and stuff i knew that if i studied chemistry that's where i could end up so so that kind of pushed me to work much much harder um and to work more practically i guess be smarter about how i was going to take my exam and um and yeah just kind of get my head down really yeah so how did it um because for a lot of us, um, especially when we're even at AS level and at the ends of IGs, we're like starting to think about, you know, careers and university choices. And we sometimes link them very deeply. We think that whatever we study at uni is going to, you know, determine the next 50 years of our life. Did you, did you feel that when you decided to study chemistry and has, is it translating to you, especially now uh, in your work experience, is that, is there some, is there a deep intrinsic connection between career and degree? In my particular job at the moment, I'd say there is, mm-hmm. but that's not necessarily the case. So part of the reason I chose chemistry and this, some of the advice I got from my teachers and my parents is that if you pick a, if you pick a, a STEM degree, like chemistry, physics, maths, engineering, anything like that, mm-hmm. you're not limited to those jobs when you leave university because those degrees are kind of yeah. held with really high regard, right? Because people know that they're, they're hard degrees. You know, you have to work very hard to, to get the degree. So a lot of companies will hire you just because you have that degree. So I've, I have lots of friends who did chemistry who have gone off to yeah. do um, banking, um, financial services, um, patent lawyers. Wow. Um, I've, I've got a friend who works as a journalist at the BBC who studied chemistry. Um, so, you, you know, you're not limited by, by where you go. And that's, that's one of the kind of beautiful things about chemistry is that you, you, you have so many more options than you would if you did something much narrower, I think. Absolutely. And I kind of resonate exactly with that as well, because when I decided to study math at university, it was kind of for a similar reason. I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do with my life, but I knew that I enjoyed the subject. I was passionate about it. And I knew I had that kind of inkling that whatever you ended up doing with a degree, you know, you, you were kind of available in front of the, in the world's eyes as someone who's, pushed really hard, done a very difficult degree, but, you know, came out at, at the end of it. And so you're, you've kind of like proven the ability to learn, the ability to pick up new skills. I, I think you would, you'd agree with that. I, I'm sure that the science degrees aren't just content. There's so much more. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I, I think also that when you do a science degree, you, you start to understand and learn things that you would never imagine existed in the first place it kind of opens your mind to so many new ideas that yeah. you wouldn't think were possible you know they sound so abstract but yeah they're they're proven and that's what's quite exciting about it i think mm. so tell, tell me a bit more about um because so, so you ended up deciding what you want to study how did it how did you like kind of narrow it down to where you were stud- where you're going to study it and is cardiff home for you or was it slightly further away so yeah, so I, I I live down in Kent, um, and I, I chose Cardiff in Wales. So that's about about three hundred miles from home. Yeah, and I I originally chose Cardiff because it was one of the top three schools for pharmacy in the country. So I I picked based on 
how highly ranked the universities were for the subject I was choosing. Okay. Um, I think that's that's probably the best advice I can give because all of that feedback is based off of um, kind of student feedback and what employers think of that department of that university. Yeah. Um, and so that's probably the best advice I would give. Maybe it's not necessarily going to a great university it means you're going to get great teaching. It's more how well do people how reputable is the course at that university? So mm. I think at the time Cardiff was second in, it was like first or second in the country for pharmacy. So I, I chose that that um, school in particular. Interesting. Um, so um, I want to kind of, um, if we've had a kind of a bit of a chat about university and choice, I want to go into kind of your work experience right now. It sounds super interesting. And I have some of the listeners are have quite a, quite specific science questions as well but tell me a bit more about what it entails being a synthetic chemist synthetic what yes yeah, synth- synthetic organic chemist is my official title so um okay yeah yeah so basically what it means is every day i go to work um i i usually start by planning an experiment so based on what we think we're going to be doing i write out um kind of a plan for what I'm going to be doing in the lab. Okay. And then I'll go into the lab. We have a, we have really nice labs at work. It's kind of big, big glass wall and you can see all the kind of mm-hmm. the lab equipment behind the, behind the glass and you kind of go in and it's really um, modern and, and interesting. So we, yep. we go in there um, and we carry out our reactions based on the plan that we've made. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then we obviously monitor it. We use techniques. So if anyone's done chemistry, they'll be familiar with NMR. Um, uh, liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, yeah, um, and yeah, and then so we then gather that data, interpret it, um, see if the experiment has worked. Um, if it has, then we kind of you know work it up and we isolate material and then we um, kind of log it so that we we have that material if we need to look back at it. And then if it hasn't worked, then it's much trickier because then we have to figure out right what what didn't work why why did we think it was going to work and what could have happened so then that's where that kind of background chemistry knowledge is really important because you absolutely so you can go back to the theory of it yeah exactly so yeah. so if i've got you know five chemicals in in a chemical reactor and i do a reaction i'm expecting you know a chemical a to react with b to give c you know and then instead i get c d e and f then i have to look at the, the, all the, the chemicals that I put in there in the first place and think, right, what possible products could I form with all these different chemicals in there? Yeah. Um, so that's where stuff like problem solving and critical thinking mm. is really important. Yeah. Are you usually in a team? Is that how you're working when you're when you're in your kind of um, this, this type of experience? Or is it very individual and then reporting back to someone at the end of it? So for my my placement, I have a mentor um, who I who I sit with every day, and he's been he's been working okay. with Pfizer for I think around twenty years. Um, he's been there he's been there a long time, so he's obviously got a lot of experience. He knows what he's doing okay. a lot of the time. Um, and so, you know, when you first start, they're very much um, very supportive. So they're kind of with you in the lab every day, watching you do your experiments, make sure you like you know, if you don't know what you're doing, that they can kind of guide you. Um, but then the longer the longer I've kind of been here, the more independent you become, uh-huh. um, which is really valuable experience, especially if you're going Absolutely. to do, say, a master's or a PhD or anything after that, or even work in a lab as a job. Then to be able to say that you've worked independently is is Absolutely. really important. And and what sort of skills have you built up? Uh, I'm I'm obviously hearing a lot of like critical thinking, problem solving, um, just being I think physically adept at handling lots of equipment and uh, all that kind of stuff. Is there, because I, maybe it, it will be a good point to highlight as well that you've decided to, I guess some people call it a sandwich year where you've decided to have work experience after the third year of your university. And then you're going to return to university for your fourth year and finish a master. So overall you've taken five years to do your degree. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So what, what led you to this choice and how, how do you feel whether is it, was it worth it? And would you recommend it to us? I yeah, it, it was an unusual. It was an unusual kind of saying we haven't had anyone do this before. So is this something that you kind of want to go down? And obviously, I, I kind of doubted myself a little bit, thinking is it a good idea? Is it not? But ultimately, I mean, unless you're planning on doing a PhD, and even if you are, your 
going to university so that you can one day have a job. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we're now more than ever with, with so many people going to universities that practical experience is so important. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's a way to not only differentiate yourself, but you're developing a skill set that you wouldn't necessarily have at university. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are a lot of things that I've gained from working with Pfizer that I didn't know how to do when I was at university. There were certain types of data I didn't know how to analyze. And, you know, I was much less, I was much more dependent in a laboratory than I am now. So obviously going back next year to do a master's when you have to do an independent research project in a lab, yeah. um, a lot of those skills are going to be really important. And I, I would say that if, if, if that's something you decide to do, and obviously it's something you have to speak to university to see if they're okay with you doing, I think most universities are, um, then you should think about is the work experience I'm going to get going to be applicable to either my further education or the job mm-hmm. that I hope to get after university. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, just speaking about Pfizer and the pharmaceutical industry in general, um, like how how closely are you to working with like kind of at the end of the day taking your research and whatever experiments you're doing to actually creating a drug or a useful piece of medicine that's going to be used by people? How's that process? Do you feel part of it or is it quite like disparate? No, no, definitely, definitely feel part of it. So, so we have. Um... We have kind of two teams working on, um, so so my particular area is called process development. Okay. So you kind of have two fields. You have medicinal chemistry, which are the kind of drug discovery team. Okay. So they are the ones who identify new compounds that might be um, used for treating diseases. Um, it could be anything, you know, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, anything like that. Um, so they discover the compounds and then we have to find a way of making those drugs safely and affordably. So, you know, there's no point making a drug for heart disease um, if it's going to cost, you know, £10,000 a gram because, you know, <laughs> the NHS can't afford that. People people won't be able to afford drugs like that. So we have to find a way of, you know, what reagents could we use in place of the ones that have already been proposed um, and then be able to scale it up to make, you know, thousands of kilograms of this drug at a time um rather than say you know 10 10 grams at a time because you can't you, know, you can't make that much of a drug at once a slightly more controversial question which um probably doesn't deal with a lot with um <laughs> stem at all actually but it it's an important point and um i, I really i'm interested in, in this idea anyway um in particular when you're looking at uh when you're working in pfizer or in stem industries across the world do you think that this this idea of the ch- the gender pay gap is is a real thing. Is it is it present around you, or have you experienced it? Um, and and I'm, I'm particularly asking about these kind of STEM jobs because another big issue is that the the lack of you know females in STEM and promoting that uh, among young girls and and you know that you should you should feel as confident to study science and math at university as you feel for anything else. You know there shouldn't be that kind of uh, gender inequality as such. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, so I can only really speak from personal experience um, and, and yeah. from what I've seen. So Pfizer are particularly good with with that aspect of things. So mm-hmm. they there's there's pretty much a 50-50 ratio of, of scientists working in the lab um, of men and women. Um, and they're very much of the idea of men and women should receive the same pay, which I think most... Yep hopefully most companies are heading towards now um it's obviously it's such a hot topic at the moment that a lot of companies want to be want to be seen as you know doing their part and and being proactive in making sure that men and women are having the same opportunities to go into science if that's what they choose um and so i think it's 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 definitely um highlighted a lot in in the media at the moment and i think it's it's good because Mm-hmm. they're kind of choices that people wouldn't have necessarily decided to go to go down um yeah and so it's really important kind of being proactive and encouraging people towards those areas so like for example we um we have a program at, at our site at pfizer called um community lab so it's a, a kind of former um research lab at pfizer um that's now open to schools um to come and do their kind of a level 
um, practical chemistry um, yeah. experience in the lab. Um, and so obviously in, in school where you've got an equal proportion generally of, of boys and girls, you, everyone's getting the same opportunity to find out whether they would be interested in science. Um, and I think that's really great because it's a hands-on experience that um, everyone can everyone can yeah. take part in. And I'm sure like working or being in an industrial size lab would be quite uh, quite different and it will be quite motivating to some people if they want to pursue that kind of thing in their in their future life. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So um, slightly um, kind of like moving away from, uh, moving into actually like the hot topics of right now, which is obviously COVID-19 and, and, and you being in the pharmaceutical industry and being involved with medicines and just give us some thoughts of what do you think that's happening? And there's, there's a lot of specific questions that our, 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 our listeners had about using AI for development of the treatment and um, like talking about the vaccines behind it. But what, what do you, what, is there anything that you have in your, in your mind, especially coming from a quite a theoretical background? Okay. Um, <laughs> it's quite a tr tr tricky question, I it guess. It is, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, um, no, it's fine. Um, so uh, the, the point you made about AI, um, so I have seen yeah. some some development. So um, there are a few companies who are looking to use AI to do diagnostic modeling. So I believe there's a Swiss company uh -huh. um, who are a kind of blood analytics company and they're using artificial intelligence to read lots of variables in people's blood tests um, to measure um, a variety of parameters like uh, leukocyte count, hemoglobin count, all that sort of, sort of thing, um, antibody count, to develop a kind of probabilistic value of mm. whether someone has COVID or not. Um, there, there, there's a lot on um, kind of computer modeling of um, computational chemistry tools. So predicting whether new drug molecules will bind to the kind of proteins and receptors um, that are associated with the disease. Um, seeing a lot more of that, so computational chemistry, building speed a lot more in, in the last kind of 10, 20 years or so. Okay. Um, and AI is, and machine learning is becoming part of that because they can screen a lot more molecules um, based on those kind of calculations. Um, I've also seen a little bit on AI being used to screen through kind of peer-reviewed literature on potential antiviral compounds um, and pre-existing antibodies that were used for previous drugs. So um, so things like, uh, you know, influenza, there's, there's lots of drug molecules that target influenza. And so there's a lot of um, implication of AI being used to read those scientific papers to work out whether the research in that would be applicable to treating COVID. Interesting. That's, I guess, like going through hundreds of thousands of papers and of research papers is probably not a very humanly possible task of getting a computer to work on that is sounds like a good idea exactly yeah yeah so uh, a bit more on that bit so we've also seen like the highlight this kind of virus has highlighted a lot of issues in our in our systems and it's probably all our systems from our financial systems to our um you know educational systems but in particular it's re realized that we have a lack of funding, especially in these research areas. Um, what do you think about that? And do you think that after this kind of pandemic goes through, will we see something, some more, um, more funding towards natural sciences and, and research or, or what do you think? Um, well, uh, it's kind of disappointing in a way because just before this kind of coronavirus stuff started, the, the, the chancellor, um, Rishi Sunak had pledged to double spending in, yeah, in the UK government's research and development by 2024. Um, so we were lo really looking at a, a massive increase um, of about 15% in, into research and development. And now I think a lot of that money has to have been, and rightfully so, has to be diverted towards sustaining the economy. Um, Absolutely. Um, which which I totally understand, um, but I think it's, it's kind of a shame for science in, in the short term because a lot, a lot of that money was going to go to some really excellent high quality research in environmental science and, and uh, biomedical new biomedical discoveries so i'm sure i'm sure that that funding will come back hopefully hopefully yeah um 
but um yeah it's, it's not it's not a situation because obviously a lot of a lot of the uk's um budget has now been assigned to to keeping the economy afloat yeah yeah absolutely it's it's a tricky time well um i think our tomato timer is going off because we've hit 25 minutes so um any last words before we wrap this up any piece of advice to give to our students um i would just say um work hard um find find the subjects you're really passionate about um and uh and yeah and that if you just keep doing that and look for opportunities that'll that'll take you to a job that you want to do amazing it's been such a pleasure having you tom it's and it's been amazing to like get you to launch this new stem careers uh series on our podcast um we hope to see you hear from you in the future thank you so much for being here yeah thanks for having me right thanks guys it's been a pleasure um and as you know we're going to be doing another episode on tuesday so we hope to see you there bye and that's another episode of the tomato timer if you'd like to ask your questions and join us live next week join the xenos discord server the invite link is in the description and to learn more about Zenodes and how a bunch of students are on a mission of making quality education available to all, go to zenodes.org. Bye for now.